And now, Professor Michael Noel of the University of Pennsylvania. And when you read his biography online, he's attended every correct school and he's in all the important organizations. So you will know how to judge what's important by looking at his bio. <laughs> Thank you, Joe Marie. But of course, we know that's the last way to judge anything, right? right? We don't judge. We don't judge on our words, on our actions, and that's um, and very much what you're doing today is you're adding to those words. You're trying to accelerate and strengthen a debate which one side is very well funded and not all voices are as well, as well funded. And I think that is uh, terrific and that is important and that frankly ought to be valued by all sides. Those who agree and those who, do, who disagree. At the end of the day, we're trying to help provide information and help for those who are going to make these policies. Um, my talk today is based on joint work with uh, Ruth Mason professor at the University of Virginia uh, Law School. And um, I have to begin with an apology. I am one of those people who needs to leave early today to catch a flight. So I'm sorry, I won't be able to stay for the whole panel. I won't be able to uh, be able to hear my the other speakers, but I will not be able to stay for the comments, and I will not be able to stay for any questions from the audience. I apologize. I look forward, though, to looking at all of, or a lot of what I've missed, the like rest of my panel and some things tomorrow when the video gets posted. Uh, I also want to say thank you. Thank you very much to Allison for including me in this conference. It's been very interesting. Uh, I've enjoyed the panels today. And I was especially taken by sort of Allison's remarks at first when she said, well, why are we here? We're here because we need to have better articulation, better answers to the question, who has rights, what are those rights, and against whom are those rights? Many of you are very much involved in trying to reach from, creating, from the arguments of substantive human rights into tax law, and how, therefore, taxes need to respond to those rights. My role here is somewhat smaller. I want to talk briefly about how the European Union has, in part, answered Allison's questions. I say in part because the rights that they've recognized and that they recognize uh, and connect with the tax system aren't meant to displace other rights. Uh, they're they're not meant to suggest necessarily that there are other rights, but I think there are what the EU would say is part of the system, and which I would like to sort of encourage those of you who are looking to uh, strengthen the connection between taxes and more substantive rights, to, to keep in mind these procedural rights as well as the EU views them, because I don't think they are in any ways inconsistent with the more substantive rights that we've been discussing most of the day. Uh, the EU, as uh, many of you know, and many of you know quite uh, better than I do, is uh, it's made up of 28 countries <coughs> and growing. Uh, about 500 million people live within the EU. And the GNP is over $16 trillion. The EU is, describes itself as the world's largest economy. GDP, it's larger than that of either the United States or China. And the reason they describe themselves as a single economy rather than, yes, 28 countries, you have to add it all up, you get a lot, is the idea of a single market. That the European Union is supposed to be a single economy where goods, persons, services move as easily throughout that economy as they do within a single state. And in many ways, the EU was, so it was created, was created, obviously in the aftermath of the Second World War, as the speaker mentioned earlier, but also looking towards the United States, a large economy, and seeing that within the European Union, 
It was very common to have national champions protected in national markets, doing very well in those markets, but being unable to enter neighboring markets because of protection, and being unable to compete with many large companies, many of them U.S. from outside the EU, who weren't protected in that way. And so, as an economic idea, and sort of forming the formative ideas behind the EU was the idea of tearing down burdens between those nations, being able to create not national champions, but maybe one, maybe often several, large multinational European companies who can compete on a world stage, who could provide goods and services more cheaply, who would be able to hire more local workers, and provide for economic growth in Europe. And the single market was sort of born out of that idea. Now the European Union so it protects the single market in two ways, or promotes it, maybe a better word. They promote it what's called positive integration. And that's the idea that the European Union, as an organization, often working through the states, will try to harmonize their laws in certain areas, create similar laws throughout. The idea that law could be used, and often has been used, to protect against outsiders, tear down those rules, create similar laws, make it easier for companies to operate. That's sort of the idea of positive integration. Negative integration is the idea that, sort of, that courts need to step in and take action when states take actions that prevent, that, that tend to give into protectionism and prevent the formation of a broader economic union. That's the idea of negative integration. It's enforced by the courts. Uh, the Court of Justice of the European Union, uh, the unfortunate acronym CJEU. Uh, somebody mentioned ECJ earlier. I find that so much easier to say. Uh, but my co-author, who's the real EU scholar, says it's now the Court of Justice of the European Union. And difficult, a mouthful to say, has an unfortunate acronym of CJEU, you just can't say that quickly, but nonetheless is incredibly important in understanding the economic development um, in Europe. And uh, they enforce the EU treaties, they enforce the legal requirements that all member states are obligated to in this quasi-constitutional way. Um, and what I find interesting uh, certainly in the context of our, our being here about the EU treaties and contrast them with the U.S. Constitution. The U.S. Constitution defines these issues, these economic issues, as restrictions on the member states. The member states can't do this, they can't do that. In the European Union, these same issues were framed and defined affirmatively as rights of the individual. The EU sort of talks about um, free movement rights. That's the language in the treaties. The rights of residents, individuals, citizens of the EU, and to a degree even outsiders, have rights of free movement within the European Union. Um, so these rights are in fact called the fundamental freedoms or sometimes the free movement rights. And the basic rights are the free movement of goods, so the idea that goods produced in one state can move easily to the next state, or any other state in the Union. Free movement of services, so for an example, a lawyer working in Europe, can provide, in England, can provide services in Italy. The free movement of capital, Investment capital can move throughout Europe, and this is the one right that even applies to those from outside, capital coming in, and the free movement of people. And this has got a lot of attention in maybe the last 10 or 15 years in, throughout Europe, especially with the movement south and north, and it's very much connected with work. The idea is people are moving to work, and the rights that are protected are related to that. 
And lastly, a right of establishment, which is a business right. The right of businesses to set up establishments in other states. These rights uh, have a non-tax dimension, where they're referred to as um, restrictions. They also have a tax dimension, where they come with, where they are manifested in terms of tax discrimination. States that engage in tax discrimination will see their rules struck down. I think that <laughs> language is quite interesting. It's very much value-laden language, the idea of discrimination. And I think that is what the courts, and I think that's what the founders of the EU have in mind. They saw a system where local states would frequently apply laws, sometimes quite explicitly, sometimes implicitly designed to keep out the outsider, which here was somebody from another state. And so tax discrimination is the device the court uses to strike down such actions. Um, there have been a lot of tax discrimination cases because in the EU, to change the tax, the harmonized tax laws requires unanimity among the member states, which is very hard to get. Whereas most other rules do not. They just require um, you know, a, a set supermajority. Um, in addition, it's sort of interesting, continuing with this idea of individual rights, in the European Union, there's a notion of direct effect. An individual can sue another state or, or any state on the idea that that state is in violating that individual's fundamental rights, including those free movement rights. And that's the way most of these cases come about. And the language the court uses, and I find these opinions hard to read, and I'm delighted to have a wonderful co-author who's a real expert in it. Um, as I said, hard to read, hard to make sense of, at least for somebody not schooled in them. But we often see language about discourage, deter, the notion of trying to keep that outsider out and can be done even, you know, even if done subtly. The effects have been significant. The court, of, uh, the court has forced member states to change the way they offer social benefits, um, general, requiring them to offer pretty much on a pretty open basis to their residents on their full income, both home and abroad, and when they're not available, say to somebody who works entirely in another state, the state of source has been required to provide those benefits. Um, they've also forced states to pretty much change their corporate tax systems. In the EU, corporate taxes are integrated with the individual taxes. Most states used to have what were tax credits, imputation tax credits. Tax the individual, get credit for the corporate tax paid. European states wouldn't provide those credits when the corporate tax was paid abroad. That was struck down. As a result, because most states want to collect the corporate tax, what they now do is they tend not to tax the individual so they can collect the corporate tax from everyone. Um, there are a lot of technical issues here, and people have different views of them. Ruth and I, that's really what we're working on. But the point I really want to make um, goes back to another point Allison made when she said and described it as provocative, being provocative. Those adversely affected by tax policy, policy should have a say in how those policies are created. I think what the EU has essentially done is the EU says we can't really give them a voice in this context. But what we can get is as an organization made up of all of these states, we can solve some of these problems directly. We know one place where individuals are taken advantage by local states is through taxes and other rules designed to keep them out. And we are going to prevent states from doing so. And that's what they've done in their law. Now, interestingly, those rules are purely negative rules in the sense of that they say, member states, you can't do this. Most of the rights we've been talking about today are affirmative rights. And I don't think there's any conflict in these two systems. I think it is possible, consistent with these EU procedural negative rights, to pretty much design a wide range, almost any affirmative tax system you would like to 
set up. The only thing you can't do in the EU is in setting up that affirmative tax system, you can't take advantage of outsiders. And I think that's an issue or a position that almost anybody who's interested in fairness and justice in a tax system and in a legal system would endorse. So thank you very much.